Good afternoon and uh, welcome to our webinar, War in Ukraine, Comments and Perspectives from UCSD Experts. My name is Frank Bies. I'm a professor of history and the co-director of European Studies here at UCSD. We live in disturbing, uncertain, perhaps even anxiety producing times. This is why we brought together experts from UCSD to provide some comments and perspectives on the war in Ukraine. As a public and service oriented institution, we want to draw on some of our local expertise here at UCSD to answer at least some, though certainly not all, of the questions you might have. We also hope to present a deeper perspective than what you might be able to read in the newspaper or see on the news. So I welcome students and colleagues from UCSD, but especially also the members of our local community. I know we're all a bit tired of Zoom, but the medium does offer this exciting possibility to reach a wider audience than it might otherwise be possible. I also would like to thank our staff person, Anna-Marie Buen-Biache, who uh, helped in organizing and putting together this event. And um, if you're interested in even he hearing even more, I would like to um, announce yet another webinar that will take place on Monday, March 14th at 3 p.m. on the Chinese role in this conflict. It's organized by the School of Global Policy and Strategy and by our 21st China Center, also with local UCSD experts. Before we get started, I would just like to make one brief comment. We're all inclined to discuss the big questions of military strategy, of economic relationships, and of international geopolitics. And I'm sure we'll do so in the next one and a half hours. But I think we should always be aware of what all of this means for the people on the ground. People like the 43-year-old Tatiana, the mother of 18-year-old Mikita, and nine-year-old Elisa. As the New York Times reports, a Russian shell killed all three of them last Sunday together with 26-year-old Anatoly, was trying to help them to escape from Irpin just outside of Kiev. The photo of their lifeless bodies has already become an iconic representation of what really is at stake in this conflict. So I think we should also be aware of the danger of abstraction and keep in mind the human dimension of this conflict. We will have short presentations from each of our presenters. And after they have given their presentations, there will be time for questions. So I would like to ask you to put your questions in the Q&A section of um, the, 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 the Zoom. Um, you can find this at the bottom of your Zoom window. We will also have a recording of the event. And my European Studies co-director, Ulrike Strasser, will help me in monitoring the chat. And then I will pose the questions to the panelists. I would like to apologize in advance if we can't get to all of the questions, but we'll try to get to as many as possible. So um, I will introduce the presenters just before they speak. So um, our first presenter is my colleague, Robert, Robert Edelman. He is a professor of history and the author of many books on the history of the Soviet Union. Most recently, Spartak Moscow, a history of the people's team in the workers' state, published by Cornell University Press, which won several prestigious prizes. So Bob, the floor is yours. Well, I can't say I'm glad to be here, but I understand it's my obligation and what I signed up for in entering this field. Sometimes I wonder if it would not have been easier to study France. Uh, well, like all of you, 
I'm frightened and appalled by what we've seen in these weeks from Ukraine and from Russia. Back in the Soviet period, I spent six months in Kyiv researching my second book, and it's a very human metropolis with lovely old neighborhoods. And in fact, my grandparents were all from the Padol, the Jewish quarter, and they all left before 1917. So what I'm going to tell you today is what I tell my students at our first lecture. So this is sort of Russia 101, or actually it's HIEU 114, should you choose to sign up. Um, if you want to delve deeper for more nuance, please don't, of course, hesitate to ask. So my task today is to provide several possible historical explanations for Russian behavior at the present moment, but please do not take explanation as in any way indicating approval. For the better part of a century, the dominant paradigm of Russian history was that of a strong, powerful autocracy that dominated a weak, passive society, making change an impossibility. For generations of historians, especially in the West, it was believed that the Russian and then the Soviet people got the governments that they deserved. The concept of totalitarianism can then be seen as a modern version of this paradigm. And well, starting with the late 1960s, a new cohort of historians of Russia challenged this paradigm and argued that the two empires that ruled the East Slavic lands, the Russian and Soviet, had in fact collapsed. That under certain circumstances, the people who lived there were not passive, that they were capable of resistance. And I am part of this cohort, which over the last decades has now dominated our field for some time. So I'm very sorry, but also proud to say that Vladimir Putin rejects our interpretation of Russian history, even if some of us have had to rethink our earlier views in recent days. Not long ago, Putin wrote that the Russian empire's greatness was in its strong rulers. So he sees himself following in the footsteps of Ivan the Terrible in the 16th century, Tsar Alexei Mikhailovich in the 17th, and Emperors Peter the Great and Catherine the Great in the 18th century. And here Joseph Stalin fits the bill for the, this kind of ruler as well. And it is fitting that in the last few days, Putin has closed down the Memorial Museum, which has long sought to preserve the history of the victims of the Gulag. Also, there's a second, in this case, a geographical historical theme, which is that Russia's vast flatness provided few, if any, natural barriers to invasion, occupation, and the very loss of nationhood. And so invasion is the other grand explanation for Russian leaders' obsession with military matters and unfettered authority. Kyiv was sacked and burned by the Tartars in 1240 when it had been the center of the first Russian government. <clears throat> Early in the 17th century, Poles, Swedes, and Lithuanians during the long period called the Time of Troubles overran Russia, leading to the eventual creation of the Romanov dynasty in 1613. Napoleon occupied and burned Moscow early in the 19th century. Defeat in the Crimean War of 1855 led to the end of Russian serfdom. Germany invaded in World War I. After the revolutions of 1917, the Western Allies sought to overthrow the fledgling Bolshevik government, leading to three years of civil war. And the Germans came again in World War II with particularly devastating impact on Ukraine, where much of the war was fought. All of this helps explain Putin's irrational, even paranoid sense of grievance and resentment, which has been fueled by historic Russian feelings of backwardness, emotions that persist to the present day. And then there is the caveat, which may be controversial here, that the dangers of a Carthaginian peace have weakened liberal democratic governments and stoked resentments that created support for dictators. This happened at Versailles in 1919 when Germany was branded with exclusive war guilt and the new Weimar Republic was saddled with crushing reparations payments that nourished Hitler's revanchism. Jump ahead and the Cold War ended with Mikhail Gorbachev's agreement not to resist the breakup of the Warsaw Pact. In return, the new Russian government was promised that NATO would not expand into that same space. For a complicated set of reasons, that promise was not kept, although from the point of view of the present moment, that has uncomfortably proven to be a good thing. None of this, though, excuses what we now see in Ukraine. The calculated cruelties and tragedies will number in the millions and take many forms. The world will never be the same. Those who manage to survive will never be the same. Can we rely on the resistance of Russian society? There have been thousands of demonstrations, disturbances, and arrests, but not a coherent anti-war movement in the light of repression and propaganda. Putin's approval rating remains high. Maybe not now, but when the body bags come back, will they have the same impact as they did with the Soviet war in Afghanistan? But please realize that process took more than 10 years. <clears throat> 
In the course of the 20th century, defeats in war provoked the fall of the Romanov dynasty and the collapse of the USSR. Is that what it will take now? Can this even happen? Will I ever get back to the streets of Padova where my grandparents walked? Will I ever see the inside of a Russian library or archive? Will I ever see my Russian friends again? I wish I knew. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, our second presenter is uh, Professor Amelia Glazer from the Department of uh, History. She also holds an endowed chair in Jewish studies, and she's the author of several books on Ukrainian, Russian, and Jewish literature, most recently Songs in Dark Times, Yiddish Poetry of Struggle from Scottsboro to Palestine, which won the Schnitzler Award in Jewish Literature and Linguistics. And she joins us, joins us today from Harvard's Radcliffe Institute, where she's currently on a fellowship. Amelia. Frank, thank you so much for including me in the panel. And I do have to correct you. I'm, a, um, I'm an associate professor in the literature department at UCSD. I'm um, working on uh, that. Okay. I will uh, be an honorary historian as well. <laughs> so um, I am, as, as Frank mentioned, on sabbatical this year. I came to the Radcliffe Institute in Cambridge to write a book about the reimagining of Ukrainian identity since independence in 1991, and especially since the 2013-2014 Maidan protests, which are known in Ukraine as the Revolution of Dignity or the Revolutia Hidnasti. Um, and when Putin invaded Ukraine a couple of weeks ago, he claimed that he was doing this special operation aimed at denazification. Um, and this, this claim that Ukrainians were somehow right-wing uh, fascists, nationalists, went against everything that I've observed in contemporary Ukraine, especially since the Maidan in, uh, in 2013, 2014. So I've shared with you on the slide just a few pictures that I've taken on a couple of trips to Ukraine since the Maidan, this is in uh, 2016, and then again in 2019, um, you see, you know, this this image on the left of the, uh, you know, the art that was from the Biennale in Kharkiv in 2019, which was a, a display of art by young artists. I think everyone there was under the age of 40. Um, this picture just below that is of a a, a dinner at the Ukrainian Jewish Studies Association uh, conference in held in Odessa, and the the man holding forth is my friend Vitali, who is currently fighting. He is a volunteer soldier defending his home city, Kyiv. Um, you also see in the picture Ifim Melamed, uh, the late Ifim Melamed, and also uh, 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 the late. Um, Reutbord, uh, who was an artist in Odessa, both passed away of COVID over the past year. Um, so it's been a, a, a difficult few years for Ukraine. Um, you also see here um, the, you know, some cafe culture and art that's taking place. Over on the corner is uh, my friend Yuri, who started a kind of maker's center called the Tiny Garage for children to learn woodworking. And they're putting something together for the Biennale. And um, here is a cafe that was opened by ta Crimean Tatar refugees in Kyiv after uh, many of the Tatars had to leave the Crimean Peninsula following the occupation of the peninsula. So that just gives you a little bit of a sense of the kind of vibrant life that was happening in, in, uh, in Ukraine before the bombing began. Um, but what I'm interested in and what I'm still interested in as a scholar is the development of a strong democratic and rather united identity that was a factor that Russia and, and perhaps the rest of the world probably underestimated at the beginning of this war. Um, clearly, no one expected Ukrainians to mobilize and fight in the way that they have over the past two weeks. No one expected Zelensky, who was elected three years ago as a relatively inexperienced president, he was an actor and comedian, to become the war commander that he has. Um, and yet Ukraine's firm ideology as a free democracy, as a diverse democracy, is arguably one of the reasons that they have managed to resist the onslaught of the last couple of weeks in the way that they have. Um, and I want to share with you, a, a, hopefully this won't take me over time, but I wanted to share with you a poem by um, the poet Boris Khersonsky from Odessa, which is supposed to go up later today on, on Lit Hub. Kids, here's a geography lesson. Here's a map. Let's memorize it. There's no Siberia or Kalima in Ukraine. 
And here's the Vladimirsky Highway off to the side, way off to the side. I'm certain they're not completely, this is a geography lesson. This land won't go to waste. There's not enough space, no place to build huge camps. It's not that we're cramped and angry, but compared to Russia, we don't have the expanse and we have no taiga and the snow isn't so white and the shackles have rung out less on our roads, but the sabers more often and the church bells were louder and we've never cared much about the universe, but about our own housekeeping. But this is all psychology and now it's time for our geography lesson, a local lesson from the front door to the gate. Every hut in our beloved country is on the edge and to be honest, I'm on the edge too. I feel sorry for the ones at the center, but really I'm especially sorry for the ones in the camp towers watching the frosty distance. I'm sorry for the land beneath the searchlights. I'm sorry for the collective farm cows rumbling from hunger. There's no poetry in all this. I accept this rebuke. This is only a geography lesson, kids. Learn this lesson. And I translated that together with my colleague, Yulia Ilchuk. Uh, who's at Stanford. So Kharasonsky is a Russian speaking poet and psychiatrist in Odessa of Jewish ancestry who converted to uh, Eastern Orthodoxy in the perestroika years when he was a dissident. Um, and he represents kind of in some sense the diversity of the Ukraine that I know. This is a place that values its linguistic, religious, and ethnic diversity. In fact, they value it more than ever um, since Putin has begun to forcefully accuse it of the opposite. Um, it's a place that we have watched reimagine what it means to be Ukrainian from a kind of ethno-national group identity, which was prevalent in the years immediately following perestroika, um, to a civic identity. And this is an identity that's informed by citizenship. So whereas people who were of Russian descent used to say, well, I'm not Ukrainian, I just live in Ukraine, have started to identify as Ukrainians. The same goes for, for Jews, for Tatars, for Ukrainians of Afghani descent, uh, for Poles and Hungarians living in Ukraine. We've seen more and more people starting to call themselves Ukrainian. And this matters as Ukraine has united in its opposition to the, in the current invasion. Um, so Ukraine has worked hard to right past wrongs, to embrace its, its diversity, to be Ukrainian is not a matter of blood lineage. Um, the political scientist Volodymyr Kulik dates this shift directly to the Maidan and the invasion of Crimea, observing that, uh, that these events, I'm quoting Kulik, brought about a perceptible change in ethno-national identities, as many people felt both stronger attachment to Ukraine and stronger alienation from Russia. And, and I, I, I want to make a very fine point about this because it's not that this has always been Ukraine's identity. We have seen moments of nationalism in the past. Um, even under Yushchenko, who won the presidency in 2004, we saw, you know, we saw him doing things that would kind of try to pull Ukraine further from Russia and ended up alienating Russian speakers. For example, he bestowed the title of hero of Ukraine on uh, Stepan Bandera, who had been a right-wing nationalist in the 1940s who collaborated briefly with the Nazis against the Soviet state. And some people appreciated this gesture, but others did not. Um, and then even, even Poroshenko, who was the president after the, uh, after the Maidan ousted Yanukovych, who had been a, a pro-Kremlin president, even under, under Poroshenko, there was this idea that language was significant, that army and faith were significant. These were the three tenets on which he ran his reelection, and he lost. He lost to a uh, a secular Ukrainian Jew who was born a Russian speaker, raised a Russian speaker in an Eastern Ukrainian industrial city. Um, Zelensky had spoken out against Putin's invasion of uh, the Donbass region and of Crimea, but he'd also spoken out about uh, the importance of preserving the Russian language in Ukraine. And I think the fact that Zelensky was elected in 2019 says a lot about the electorate that wanted to have a more broadly defined idea of nationhood. So this civic energy that came out of the Maidan um, has led to all kinds of new artistic efforts, political efforts to acknowledge Ukraine's diversity. And this has been in part in response to accusations that Ukraine is nationalist. Um, so non-Jewish Ukrainians have embraced Jewish history as part of the Ukrainian story. The Lviv-based poet Mariana Kianowska published a, a really interesting book about Babuin Yar, and this came out in 2017 in Ukrainian. It's recently appeared in English. Um, I, uh, 
can cite for you a few lines from that, which are uh, really lovely. Um, it's, it's told in the voices of the victims of Babin Yar. Um, so here we find Yvonne says to Nava, this place resembles Babylon, except what's getting mixed are not languages, but silences bones. Even though bodies are kept separate, I for one hang on to my folks from 33, you to your newcomers from 41. So here she's, she's setting two histories side by side, the Jewish loss in the Holocaust and the Ukrainian loss in the Holodomor or Ukrainian famine. Um, we've seen Tatar singers collaborating with Ukrainian hip hop artists. Uh, Mustafa Naim, who was one of the instigators of the Maidan, is Ukrainian of Afghani descent, who is now the deputy minister of infrastructure. Um, and so I, you know, I, I wanted to give you a little bit of a sense of the change that Ukraine has undergone, which I believe helps to explain this unity today, even as Russia has invaded cities like Kherson, which it thought would be a very easy target, Ukrainians there have put up an incredible resistance. Um, so I'll go ahead and stop there. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Amelia. And my apologies that I misspoke earlier. It just betrayed genuine Freudian slip that betrays my wish to claim you for our department. Um, our third speaker is uh, Professor Phil Röder from the Department of Political Science. He is an expert on the post-Soviet successor states and the author of several books on the politics of the post-Soviet successor states. His most recent book is Where Nation States Come From, Institutional Change in the Age of Nationalism, which was published by Princeton in 2007. Phil, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I want to thank Frank, Bob, and Amelia for reminding us how much this is costing average Ukrainians, uh, the children, the, the women, the men of Ukraine. Uh, and I hope we don't lose sight of that as I try to move us in the direction of thinking about larger policy issues. Drawing on what I think I know about the policies of Putin, Russia, and the Soviet Union, I'll venture a few speculative observations on three issues concerning Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, the first observations concern Putin's motivation in launching this invasion. The second concern his game plan for conducting the war. And the third speculate about his end game for the post-war future of Ukraine if Russia should win, which is a very big if. Um, paraphrasing what Bob said at the beginning of his comments, what I offer is explanation. Nothing I say should be seen as an excuse or justification uh, for this horrible invasion. Uh, Anne Marie, next slide, please. So concerning Putin's motivations for launching this invasion, there are three major hypotheses, that is, Putin sought to prevent expansion of NATO, to prevent democratization of Ukraine, uh, or to reunite the Russian nation or restore the Soviet Union. The evidence that I know, which is obviously incomplete, gives priority to the first of these considerations. Putin, like his closest military and security leadership, have been obsessed with what they see as the encirclement of Russia by the United States. Blocking democratization in Ukraine, I think for Putin and his closest advisors in the security apparatus has been a more instrumental consideration. It's a means to block the expansion of NATO, but not necessarily uh, in and of itself their highest priority. The nationalist projects behind the third hypothesis are not foremost in Putin's calculations, but could be used to achieve the goal of keeping NATO further from Russia's heartland. These hypotheses have been offered by ver various analysts as competing explanations for Putin's motivations for beginning the crisis, a crisis that led to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Ironically, if Russia wins this war, Russia may achieve all three of these objectives. Uh, next slide, Emory. So turning on to uh, the second big concern, Russia's game plan, uh, Putin has not divulged for us how he will conduct this war. And so we must draw on the successful templates that we think uh, the Russian military is drawing on 
uh, uh, that is the history of Russia, Moscow's expansion as taught from elementary school all the way up to the highest military academies inside Russia. These templates include the establishment of the Soviet Union following 1917, the imposition of the Soviet bloc on Eastern Europe after World War II, and the suppression of secessionist rebellion inside the Soviet Union and uh, Russian Federation. Uh, next slide, please. The only recent nearly comparable successful case is Chechnya. Now, Chechnya is not a perfect parallel to the situation in Ukraine. Nonetheless, Moscow's operation so far seems to resemble the Chechen operation. Moscow's armed forces have first concentrated on taking the capital and the major, major cities. It's a slow, lumbering, sometimes blundering, and brutal operation, just as it was in Chechnya. This has entailed substantial bombing and destruction of the centers of power, civilian deaths, and Russian military casualties. But if the Chechen operation is any indication, much more destruction may lie ahead. Moscow may seek to establish a collaborationist regime in Ukraine, drawing from uh, Ukrainian nationalists who simply want to stop the war. The Russians may have already identified someone uh, to serve as the next head of Ukraine. In Chechnya, they had picked Ahmed Kadyrov months before Moscow began its military operations, and they may have already done that for Ukraine. Moscow may shower the collaborationist government in Ukraine with money. The money will be used to cement political alliances with political brokers around uh, the country. Once Moscow defeats Ukraine's regular armed forces, assuming that happens, Moscow's armed forces and police may turn to a more selective mission of suppressing localized outbreaks of violence and rooting out isolated insurgents. But as in Chechnya, Moscow may try to leave much of the task of identifying and eliminating irreconcilable nationalists, that is what Moscow refers to as denazification, leave that task to the collaborationists. As in Chechnya, most inhabitants who do not flee will probably never forgive the Russians and will never forget their losses. Nevertheless, most will probably make a pragmatic accommodation for the sake of their children, their parents, their families, a pragmatic accommodation with the realities of Russian power. The Russians' timeline, if they are drawing on their experience in Chechnya, may well be very lengthy. It took four months to capture Grozny, the capital of Chechnya, and that was a, presumably a much easier task than taking Kiev. It took four years to establish the, uh, the collaborationist regime in Chechnya, and here it is two decades later, and they still are dealing with isolated uh, insurgent action. Uh, next slide, please. Turning finally to Putin's endgame, the threat that Putin made this past weekend to end Ukraine's statehood suggests he's already considering various options for the post-conflict Ukrainian space. The three big questions that will determine what post-war Ukraine will look like if Russia wins, again, big if, are first, whether Ukraine will be kept whole or divided. Second, whether there will be any jurisdiction identified as Ukraine or Ukraine will be simply wiped off the political maps. And third, in the eventuality that there is united or at least a rump Ukraine, how much independence will it have in foreign in domestic policy. Uh, next slide. The Soviet and Russian experiences in previous expansions may shape the options being considered by Putin and his advisor, the way bureaucrats do things. And these include five different templates that come from the Russian and Soviet experience. The most hopeful template out of, out of these options is the Cold War Soviet Finland relationship where Ukraine would retain its statehood and remain mostly free in its internal politics, but constrained to pursue a neutral, neutralist foreign policy. Second is the Soviet bloc template, where countries such as Czechoslovakia were only formally independent, 
but at least they did retain their formal statehood. Third is the Soviet Union template, where Ukraine was treated as a constituent member of a union state, and so it had only a subordinate form of statehood, but had minimal say in domestic or foreign policy. Fourth is the post-Cold War Russian Federation, in which ethnic minority areas, such as subordinate jurisdictions without uh, statehood, I have only a veneer of cultural autonomy. And fifth, and the most unpleasant template, is the Russian Empire template, where Ukraine would cease to exist as a political jurisdiction and would be divided into provinces incorporated into Russia, with no official recognition of their Ukrainianness. Now, of course, these grim scenarios are predicated on the assumption that Russia wins this war with Ukraine. What we may be able to do to prevent that grim outcome is a topic that my colleagues and hopefully uh, the audience uh, will be addressing in the conversation that follows. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Our next speaker is uh, Professor Christina Schneider from the Department of Political Science, and she also holds the Jean Monnet Chair. She's an expert on the European Union and on EU enlargement, and her latest book is entitled The Responsive Union, National Elections and European Governance, and it won the EUSA Award for the best book published in European politics. Christina. Thank you, Frank. Uh, thank you so much for organizing this. And as, as my colleagues, I just want to echo that this is a very emotional time and um, that I'm trying to put my scholar head on and, and answer some questions, um, but this should not deflect from the extent of the humanitarian catastrophe that is unfolding in Ukraine right now. So I, I will switch um, the focus um, and uh, talk a little bit more about the EU response to the crisis and hopefully answer some questions. So let me start with the question of what the role of the EU is within this conflict. And historically, the EU has played a very central role in the Ukrainian crisis. Even though we tend to focus on Russia's aversion to a Ukrainian membership in NATO, historically, it's been really the prospect of Ukraine's political and economic integration with Europe and its democratization, especially through EU membership that has caused much of the um, conflict that we see today. So the EU itself has always been about achieving peace and security through political and economic integration. And it has been explicitly open, it's been a very strong norm to offer membership to any European country that would decide to implement democratic and economic reforms. And so it was the EU that really was the impetus for the first war um, in Ukraine in, in 2014. So in 2013, sovereign Ukraine decided to defy Russia's claim that Ukraine was part of Russia and initiated talks for an association agreement with the EU, which establishes greater economic ties and is often seen as a first step toward EU membership. And it was the refusal of the pro-Russian um, um, president back then, Viktor Yanukovych, to sign this agreement that led to uh, the Maidan protests in 2013, which gave Russia the pretext to invade and to occupy Crimea a year later. So that is, we do need to understand what the EU is doing because it can play a critical role um, for Ukraine in its, um, in its future. So first of all, what has, the, what has the EU done so far? Well, what the EU has done so far is actually quite remarkable um, looking at the history of the European Union and its integration. So currently we're seeing unprecedented policy shifts on multiple dimensions. Um, we've seen um, that European leaders and the EU have implemented unprecedented financial and economic sanctions. Um, currently, EU leaders are discussing a long-term policy strategy on how to reduce gas and oil dependence from Russia. So that is something that seemed unthinkable even after Russia's um, invasion of Crimea in 2014. We also experience an increase in political unity within EU institutions and within European countries. So it has effects on um, cooperation um, amongst EU leadership, but it will also likely have effects on domestic politics, including the French election, for example. We see an unprecedented increase in cooperation on refugees, also something that did not happen 
during the Syrian refugee crisis, just as one example that was more recent. We see after a very toxic relationship between the United Kingdom and the European Union after um, the UK's exit from the EU, that uh, there is a reapproachment between and uh, that looks like um, there will be more cooperation. And then, of course, um, one big question is that there is um, at least uh, on first sight an increased potential of EU membership, not only for Ukraine, but also for Georgia and Mo Moldova. Very importantly, we're currently experiencing a momentous turn in the EU's defense strategy, which includes greater cooperation, a strengthening of the EU's collective defense article, and an increased commitment to military and defense spending. And here I just will use Germany as, as a really perfect example for this. So the invasion of Ukraine has achieved what the US has pushed for for years and what seemed really unthinkable even in January. Um, that is the revolution in Germany's security and defense policy. Uh, just to give you a few of these policies, they include a commitment to increase, um, to establish a $113 billion defense fund to modernize German, the German military. So this will be anchored in Germany's basic law, so it cannot be used for any other purpose in the future an increase in annual defense spending to more than 2% of gross domestic product. Right now, um, Germany is below 1.5%. The German government will also supply Ukraine with lethal weapons, a move that it previously rejected as being incompatible with German law. Um, it will purchase armed drones. That has been an issue that has been highly debated and very controversial in Germany. And uh, the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz has announced that Germany would indef indefinitely suspend the Nord Stream 2 pipeline project and build two LNG terminals instead. Now, currently, the two key questions are whether Europe will join the US ban on oil and gas and whether it will accept Ukraine as a full member through a fast track procedure. So let me first talk about why the EU and especially Germany have not joined in the total ban and for, uh, on oil and gas from Russia. Here, it is very important to remember that most of Europe's gas, oil and coal comes from Russia. Almost 40% um, of uh, gas in Germany is from Russia, which is in line with the average European dependency on gas. In addition, to make things worse, is that the gas storage levels in Germany, but also across Europe are at extremely low levels, um, which is a consequence um, of uh, an increase in demand last winter and Putin's refusal to increase, uh, to, to respond to that increase in demand. So it is widely accepted that if Putin cuts the pipelines and if, um, if, if Germany and Europeans uh, completely withdraw from taking gas, uh, Europeans will have to deal with a very um, real energy crisis. So, so these are very serious, serious consequences. So de despite Russia's aggression in even previously in Georgia and especially in Crimea, the German government decided to pursue a strategy of dialogue and cooperation. And it was only the attack on Western Ukraine coupled with the realization that a Russian attack on a NATO country is quite possible has made the Germans realize that the strategy is, is not really fruitful. But again, the real concerns about the consequences of this move will make an immediate ban very unlikely. So um, the current discussion I just heard this morning at the EU level um, behind closed doors indicate that leaders plan to reduce uh, dependency on Russia rapid, more rapidly than originally planned, but the, but the centered target right now is 2027 or even 2000 and, uh, 2030. The other question is about the prospectus of um, including Ukraine as a member of the EU through some fast track procedure. And some observers have argued that the EU's rhetoric on this has changed, has become more um, optimistic. It gives me no pleasure to say this, but but looking back at the discussions during the 2014 war, I have not seen a significantly different rhetoric, at least in terms of actual membership. For example, even in 2005, the European Commission president said that Ukraine's future is in the EU, which is very similar to recent statements by the Commission. I would argue that the likelihood of a rapid accession is still low and accession if it happens, would be far in the future. 
the war has indeed increased the likelihood um, of official candidacy and eventual accession of these states significantly, but uh, really depending also on the um, course and the outcome of uh, the war and the Ukraine status. So why is there an incentive even for the EU to integrate Ukraine? And so again, coming back to what I said initially, the EU's main mission has been to use its institutions to foster security, peace, and stability in Europe. And that um, the main strategy of achieving this is through the fostering of democracy and through the fostering of economic prosperity, and oftentimes by integrating states into the European Union. And so generally, there is a strong norm to integrate European countries that want to be a member of the European um, family. The main challenges, um, first of all, are, of course, Russia's um, aversion to a membership of Ukraine in the European Union, as I previously pointed out. It is also important to note that public support on EU membership in Ukraine is actually quite divided. Um, there is a much stronger support in West Ukraine, um, a much weaker support in East Ukraine, although this might change, of course, now with the invasion of Ukraine. Then, importantly, the rules of accession are quite demanding and they require the support of all 27 EU member states. So that is not an easy feat to achieve to begin with. And on average, EU enlargement negotiations have taken eight to 10 years. And despite all the public rhetoric in favor of an Ukraine membership that we've seen in the recent um, days, we already heard that EU leaders are quite divided over fast-track accession of Ukraine um, in the eve of the summit that is taking place this week in Versailles. So even if EU governments agree on an official candidacy um, in the council, EU members or EU applicants need to satisfy the, co the so-called Copenhagen criteria, which include the requirement of being a full democracy, of being sovereign, that means having control over its borders, the candidates have to have a functioning market economy, and they have to be able and willing to implement the EU's bodies, uh, body of rules and law, the so-called acquis communautaire. So the issue is, of course, that Ukraine is currently not a stable democracy, according to Freedom House. Its sovereignty has been contested, um, and it's far away of being a functioning market econ economy. There are additional concerns about the rule of law, about corruption, and a number of other issues. And of course, there is the EU's defense agreement. So the EU Article 427 is similar to NATO's Article 5. And it makes clear that an attack on an EU country is an attack on all of the EU. So if the EU decided to um, accept Ukraine as a full member into the EU at this point, it would have to immediately respond, probably militarily, um, to the Russian invasion. And that would likely cause a world war. A fast track procedure has never been implemented before. And so it would require changing the treaty and all EU members would have to agree on this. This is politically highly controversial because negotiations are really the only leverage the EU has to get countries to implement necessary political and economic reforms. And these reforms are seen as vital for the political unity um, and the stability of the European Union itself. So there are tremendous concerns that a premature accession of Ukraine could lead to an unraveling of the Union and the challenges with developments, especially in Hungary and Poland, their democratic backsliding, their obstructive behavior within the Council of the European Union have only increased um, these concerns. So despite the official rhetoric and actions of the Commission, the European Parliament and some EU members, all of this indicates that the EU isn't likely to fast track Ukraine's accession. And already today, I heard um, several EU leaders, including Germany's Olaf Scholz and France's Emmanuel Macron, have come forward to indicate their hesitancy to a fast track to Ukraine's membership. What is much more likely is that the EU would offer some symbolic gesture during the summer summit this weekend, and then potentially granting Ukraine candidate status sooner than expected and um, postpone accession negotiations, which would likely take much longer. But again, all of this depends, of course, on what status the Ukraine will have going forward. And it is not clear at all that candidacy status would deter Putin. Given that the EU has been such a vital issue um, for Putin in the past, it might just further provoke him. 
So although it is hard to predict what lies in the future, I believe that the war in Ukraine indeed has the potential to create the momentum to lead to a significant shift in how political, economic, and military order is structured within Europe. But unfortunately, and, and very tragically, this will not help the Ukrainians in the short term because the price for helping Ukraine in the short term, the EU is not willing to pay. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Our last but not least speaker is uh, Branislav Slanchev, Professor of Political Science and uh, an expert on military coercion, intra-war war negotiations, the conduct of war, and um, especially topical at this moment, war termination. He is the author of many articles and of the book Military Threats, the Cost of Coercion and the Price of Peace. Branislav. Hi. Um, thank you. So my kind of position here coming last and probably will sound the most downbeat uh, of everybody um, is uh, what I want to talk about is explain what I understand to be some of the long term causes of this uh, invasion, some of the immediate factors that prompted it to happen when it did, uh, how it's developed, and then what are the prospects of how it's going to um, um, develop um, over the next months and potentially, uh, as Professor Roder said, years. Um, the thing is, for all the causes that I will mention, like NATO expansion, EU possible candidacy, some of the immediate causes, uh, the, the, the developments in East Ukraine and the, and the Donbass region, what you need to understand is that when the Russians or their supporters argue these things, um, there, are, there is a kernel of truth to what they're saying. They say, I would say, you know, 15 to 20 percent truth and 80 percent wild interpretation and outright lies. But the problem is with these 15% of truth is that, may, that you cannot simply dismiss the arguments. You need to understand a little bit why they actually don't work. So let me start first with this the expansion of NATO as being kind of a driver to this. This is a very old, uh, uh, frankly, security issue that predates Putin, that the Soviets had to contend with, that the Russian Empire had to contend with. And that's a matter of geography, right? If you look at the European map, um, and, and you look at the European plain, what you will see, it starts very narrow in the low countries, and then it's a funnel. It starts widening as you go eastwards, and it's about 300 through 350 miles um, wide already in Poland, so between the Baltic Sea and the Carpathians. And when the Carpathian mountains swing southwards into Romania, it suddenly expands and becomes a 2,000 uh, mile frontier. So, of course, if you're sitting in Moscow and you're looking at this, it seems indefensible. Uh, the 2,000 mile front is basically very difficult to deal with. So the policy has always been to try to push uh, westward towards some kind of defensible frontier, right? So that's why Poland has such, been such a contested place because this is kind of where it seems doable between the mountains and the Baltic Sea. And as a result of this, Poland disappeared from the maps. Uh, the same thing uh, in, the, in the 17th century. This is actually a time where uh, Catherine the Great also gobbled up uh, the independent uh, Ukrainian state that insisted at the time, the Hetmanat. And then um, the communists um, also um, they did this after the end of World War II when they decided to impose communist regimes there and control essentially these East European states as a buffer between the West and Moscow. And when you think about it, at the time, they did have a decent argument. And the argument had been Russia had been invaded from the West multiple times over the last couple of centuries. You know, France, Sweden, Germany, several times, Poland as well. Um, and they all came through the same corridor. And uh, we also, um, the, the West was obviously hostile to communism and kind of, uh, it was easy to understand how the communists um, thought that, uh, you know, the West is out to destroy them. So they did have kind of a, a tenable argument. Um, I would argue Putin doesn't have this argument today, and I'll explain why. But the biggest problem is, for, for this kind of uh, logic, so under this logic, of course, the invasion of Ukraine seems predetermined. They will never allow it, they will always have to take it. The problem with this logic is twofold, and one is always been the case, and that is that it sounds okay when you're sitting in your chair and musing about world politics. But if you happen to live in these areas that the Russians want to use as buffer states, it looks very different. And the reason this looks different is because the Russians could never trust 
the governments in these countries to remain essentially, uh, to function as a buffer without a more direct control from Moscow. The reason for this, um, I think, are twofold. One is the, pure, the sheer size of Russia. Uh, basically, the, uh, the, as we see now, if the Russians put their mind to something, the neighboring countries simply cannot do anything on their own. They, they, they cannot resist it. Uh, and, you know, and it will, I think uh, that's despite the heroic resistance of the Ukrainian, you will see very soon, I think there's going to be tremendous civilian suffering there. And usually in the past, that would translate with the, into the collapse of the regime. So um, the, even if you can organize something, it is, uh, you simply cannot stop. Or the, Again, I don't want to prejudice this. So far, it has been very difficult to stop a Russian army that tries to, to go there and, and do things. And that, of course, scares their neighbors. Some of them have tried neutrality for a while, and some have opted for some closer cooperation with the West to become part of a kind of a security umbrella with the West. It's like the Baltic Republic. So the difference between the Swedish and the Finnish model for neutrality and the Baltic state model. Um, the problem, of course, the second part of this is, so you're afraid, you can try neutrality, you can try cooperation with the West. But the second problem is traditionally, as it's happened today, the lo a lot of the ties with Russia, economic ties, uh, are not simply profitable. And basically, uh, Russia has always been backward compared to the rest. So once you start developing your economy and you want economic growth and you want things like this, all these governments start more and more ties with the West. It's always been like this. It was like this. Uh, it was going to be like this even during the Cold War if the Russians hadn't put a stop of it, to it. So as a result, the Russian, uh, the, the Soviet state had to essentially pay to maintain its empire in Eastern Europe because Eastern European states were producing stuff that they couldn't sell in the West. The only market really was Russia. These were not very good things that the Russians were buying, and they were paying them through the nose, cheap energy and things like this, to maintain this, which eventually contributed to the bankruptcy uh, of the Soviet state, actually. Uh, so, left to their own devices, very, these governments naturally, essentially for economic reasons, um, and not just economic, but a lot of it is economic reasons, turn toward the West. So from a Russian perspective, these are not reliable. They are not going to function as buffers. The communist solution was to impose communist regimes. Putin's solution was going to be to impose a puppet regime, uh, if, you, if you believe this. Now, should you believe this, is the question. So the first thing, again, I want to underline is that this, this concept of security that's been bandied about denies self-determination to any of the neighboring states. They simply, basically, you know, if you're a neighboring Russia, them's the breaks. You have to deal basically with, with Moscow uh, from a subservient perspective. And of course, if you're a Pole, if you're Lithuanian, if you're Latvian, if you're Estonian, if you're Bulgarian, if you're Romanian, you may not like this, right? And uh, then what do you do about this is the question. Now, the reason I think that the security, this explanation doesn't hold water is twofold. First of all, Putin himself doesn't actually rank it that high. If you listen to his pronouncements, especially over the last years, this is mentioned, but it is not really something that he harps uh, on a lot. Although, ironically, now with the mobilization and all this thing, it may become a threat to the Soviet, oh, so I'm sorry, the Russians uh, over the long term. But in the immediate threat right now, it's not clear that it was anything to worry about. I mean, his policies, which was to wreck NATO and, and the U European Union, have been actually going quite well overall. You got Brexit, you have the Europeans bickering among themselves all the time. They cannot agree on a common defense policy. You have kind of um, less liberal members of the European Union, like in um, uh, Orban's Hungary and in Poland, of course, kind of pushing away from this idea of, you know, unified liberal democracy with all these things that it entails. So, and that is the reason Putin had been funding all sorts of these right-wing fascist parties in Western Europe. They were doing tremendous job raising things about nationalism and how we should not be members of the EU and things like this. So this was, this was working kind of as a strategy. Uh, the meddling in the US with all these Facebook accounts and uh, formatting disagreement and exaggerating the extent of disagreement in American society, that was a playbook out of the Soviet playbook of what the KGB was trying to do. Of course, it was magnified by social media, so it probably was a lot more effective. But you can see the turmoil in the United States. That's good news for him. The way that uh, President Trump treated NATO, that's great news for Putin as well, because uh, it appeared that the United States is no longer willing to lead NATO, that it's going to demand the others to do things that the others may not necessarily like. So our 
influence globally clearly had been diminishing. So all of this was working. And all of this is for me to say is that if you're sitting in Moscow and you're wondering about the possible attack from the West, my question is, who's going to attack you and with what? Who? And there's nobody. There's absolutely nobody. And that's why I think it's just a pretext, which a lot of people seem to buy, but it really doesn't hold water. Um, I think also that the threat of the EU um, is, um, as an ex the, is not a direct threat. I mean, EU was so dependent on Putin and with Germany's traditional Ost politic toward the Eastern policy, toward the Soviet Union, the dependence on gas, the Europeans were bending over backwards to accommodate him. That's why I think the prospect of uh, Ukrainian membership in, in the EU was basically zero. Uh, it was never going to happen. So to, to believe that somehow this was going to happen over the next 10, 20 years, I think it was um, a bit, um, you know, uh, wishful thinking. Um, also, the Ukraine joining NATO or anything like this, um, many of the Eastern European countries, especially in Bulgaria, joining NATO was a security step, but a lot of them wanted it as a stepping stone toward joining the European Union. And I think the European Union had trouble, has still trouble digesting their last acquisitions in the sense, the last accession states in Eastern Europe, there was no appetite to allow uh, Ukraine to join. I think the problem for Putin really was the fact that Ukraine was again drifting westward. There was no question about this, but it was an example of an alternative to his rule. Uh, and it was incompatible with his vision of greater Russia, of what Russia was supposed to be. So that's what he himself says, that he wants this greater Russia. He wants to push the frontiers. He wants to restore it to greatness. And I see no reason why people don't believe him and they have to find other explanations for this. I think he is actually quite sincere about this. He's not the only leader who's published his thoughts in, in writing that people have disregarded. You might remember Hitler. He also explained exactly what he wanted to do and people were then somehow surprised when he tried to do it. So um, I have no reason to believe this is otherwise. If you watch President Zelensky's speech when he, uh, when he was elected with over 70% of, uh, of the vote, uh, uh, President of Ukraine, uh, he actually very explicitly says, we are the model of what other post-Soviet states can follow, right? If, if this is not a direct challenge to Putin, I don't know what is. So these are some longer term causes that I think here is, is Putin's vision for the, um, what Russia is supposed to be like and the direct challenge posed by a democratic, successful Ukraine that is going to uh, integrate in the West and he will not be able to control the way he, he wanted to. There are immediate causes to this as well. So for instance, look at what's happened the last couple of years. People were looking at these examples in the bordering states. Look at the troubles in Belarus in 2020 and 21, where Lukashenko had to resort to, to repression to, to stay in power. And he's, of course, is Putin's man in Belarus. Look at what happened in Kazakhstan a month ago, where the, uh, Putin had to send 2,500 Russian troops to help quell the protests against uh, uh, President Tokayev. So it was destabilizing, essentially, his his regime, of course, he's jailed and killed opponents and dissidents and all sorts of things. And it's causing problems in the sphere that he considers his. So there are immediate causes that are pushing him for further and further toward doing something about it. Um, there are internal causes in Russia as well, but I'm, uh, I'm, I don't have time to cover them. The pretext, of course, will be what's happening in East Ukraine uh, and the mistreatment of Russian speakers in Donbass and the neo-Nazis and all these sort of things. So again, the problem here is there is a kernel of truth to this. There are extreme right-wing national, Ukrainian nationalists, just like the extreme right-wing Russian nationalists, who did all sorts of things. And the problem is that the Ukrainian government did not quite do the right thing. It allowed coordination with these paramilitary units like the Azov Battalion and things like this, which were very problematic and which were the primary cause for many of the civilian deaths. Now you do hear 14,000 civilian, uh, 14,000 deaths in East Ukraine since Crimea in 2014. But you need to remember that that's the total number, right? So if you actually break it down, there's about 3,400 civilians that were killed by both sides, about 5,700 uh, from the, these people's militias that were the Russian separatists, about 500 Russian soldiers who were there, you know, without designation or anything like this, and about 4,600 uh, 4, uh, on the Ukrainian side, which of course in includes both uh, the military uh, the, and the... Um, these kind of paramilitary organizations. So there was stuff going on and both sides committed uh, acts that were reprehensible and needed to be addressed. So that's the kernel of truth. But that's where this ends. Because as some people propose, well, can't we have an agreement where, you know, Ukraine cedes East Russia, it goes independent? 
Well, you need to understand that the majority of people in East Ukraine are Ukrainian. The Russians are uh, the largest minority, but they are minority. It's like 35 or 39 percent and the largest concentrations. So the vast majority of people are Ukrainian. They're Russian speaking Ukrainians, but they are Ukrainian. And every poll we've had since 1991 has shown two things. First, very strong support for independence from what used to be done in the Soviet Union and essentially um, now Russia. When people ask directly, do they want to be closer kind of political ties with Russia? The answer, even in East Ukraine, has been no, consistently and overwhelmingly so. It's also, however, true that support for joining NATO and something like this has also been very lukewarm at best, I would say weak. So this is a fig leaf. This idea that they, he's going to come and denazify um, is just a fig leaf for what he actually wants to do, an excuse. Now, and here, here, here's why this is the, the idea that, I mean, the Russians uh, announced the independence of this. This is just meant to essentially derail any possible negotiation, I think, with the regime in Kyiv. Uh, because they know that the Ukrainian government cannot abandon millions of Ukrainians to denazification efforts in East Ukraine. So what do I think will happen? Well, I think I agree with, uh, oh, and um, before I go there, there was reason for Putin, uh, he was not, people say, ah, he's crazy, things like this. There's huge optimism, I think, when, uh, for him, on his side, on how this war would unfold, for two reasons. NATO and you, uh, the European Union were disunited, as I mentioned. Zelensky's approval had actually collapsed. It was very low because he got mired in all sorts of scandals in Ukraine, so he was seen as weak. Uh, the Russian military performance in Chechnya, in Georgia, in Syria, and in Crimea, and in East Ukraine, where, remember, they actually had intervened militarily to push back the Ukrainian army and were successful in that. Um, it suggested that they could actually do this. So the idea was a lightning strike, take Kiev, or maybe even not take Kiev, if the government fall, you know, runs away to their Western masters, as Putin would portray them, and then there will stall puppet regime, there will be no coordinated resistance, there will, of course, be uh, resistance in general. You would expect it. There will be partisan war and things like this. But they will assist this government in putting down this kind of, um, um, you know, um, armed struggle. And without this initial coordinating effort, it may have been very difficult to actually do this. Over time, it may have developed. But it's uh, you can see how he may have thought that this could work. Uh, he, of course, expected a very weak Western response due to the disunity that I mentioned and what happened after Crimea. And so a puppet regime with years of pacification is what he probably banked on. He also had reasons to, um, um, we can understand his miscalculations, things that he should have known, but probably didn't. And one of the things that I think he should have known, but probably was not informed properly about is the actual preferences of the Ukrainians. Over the last 30 years, Ukraine simply has drifted very, very far and has developed this identity. Again, it has a long history actually of statehood that people don't seem to mention for some reason, but it's been develop, developing as more and more as a very distinct uh, identity. There was no reason to suspect that they will meet the Russians as some kind of liberators with uh, flowers. But uh, also, I, I know I probably should be ending right now. Uh, just very yes, quickly. Branislav, I'm sorry, you have to end because okay. we need some time for discussions now. Okay, sorry. I was answering some of the questions in this. Discussion. Right, but let's let's just try to make sure that we sure, can get sure. to, to some of the questions as well. Thank you. Um, so maybe all the panelists can turn on their cameras and then um, we can at least get to some of the questions um, in the chat. Um, there was um, actually one question that was just posted. What do we know of true Russian public opinion on this evasion? invasion. I keep reading that Russian oligarchs won't turn on Putin. Is there a role the Russian people can or might play here? So maybe our Amelia. I'm, I'm happy to attempt to answer that. I, I think we, we can't be sure, but what the polls that I have seen coming out of Russia suggest that there is um, under 50% support for young people in Russia, that's people under 30 but certainly well over 50% for people over the age of 30. That is to say, there is still a majority support for Putin in Russia. And that's one of the reasons that there's been such a strong anti-Russian sentiment among Ukrainians since the war 
broke out. It's not just anti-Kremlin, it's not anti-Putin. They don't, they don't see a great amount of solidarity with protesting Russians. They see it as, you know, too little, too late. If they really wanted to protest against their government, they'd be out there staging a Maidan and making Molotov cocktails, and they're not doing that. You know, yes, people are being arrested, um, but they're not being bombed. And so there's very little um, kind of sympathy or solidarity among Ukrainians for Russians because of these polls that are coming out. Yeah, Phil, Phil maybe wants to add to that. Phil, oh, please go ahead. Um, I mean, I, I, the polls do show that a majority of Russians at this moment uh, support uh, Putin, though they are quite ill-informed about what's going on inside Ukraine. Um, as for you know, the, you invoked the issue of the of the uh, uh, oligarchs. Um, I mean, that raises the question: Who has the power to stop uh, Putin? It's not the oligarchs, and at the moment, uh, it's not the, the small number of protesters in the streets, uh, the people who might stage a coup would be the, uh, the Siloviki, the, the uh, power ministries, the uh, defense, intelligence, uh, and so forth. Um, those are the, the organizations that might have, but they are so heavily implicated in this. If Putin made miscalculated about how easy this was going to go, it was on the basis of it, probably on the basis of advice provided him by the by the the Siloviki, um, by the the power ministries. Uh, so they're not really in a position, and they're they are actually very he's closely cultivated people like Shoigu and others um, as as his closest closest friends and associates. So he's he's put himself in a position where at the moment uh, he's probably not uh, going to be stopped by anyone else. One possibility, and, I, and he seems to be very sensitive to this, is that if this drags on for a, an extraordinary time, and if the costs become extraordinary high, as happened to the Russian Imperial Army in World War I, you may get uh, you know, desertions in the military, collapse of morale. Um, uh, the bodies coming back to Russia will, in fact, inflame the public. And if the economic decline becomes severe enough after a couple of years, uh, you may in fact have a February revolution, uh, but you know, uh, as we took place in 1917, that's a long shot, but it's, you know, it is at the moment, one of the few vulnerabilities that one could imagine, but it's going to take, it would take a long time to unfold. Um, Um, Branislav, you want to? Uh, yeah, I would like to add to this that um, it's even worse uh, in the sense that we know that there was about, what, 58% overall support for the war initially. Uh, at that point, Putin's approval was about, I believe, 60, 61%, his personal approval. The latest polls show that his personal approval has jumped to 70% now after two weeks of fighting because the Russians are rallying behind this, what they perceive as a military operation. Most of them simply do not know. I think you should not underestimate to what extent this plays very differently in Russian media and the state control media. If you would wait, go there and watch them, it's an alternate universe where the Ukrainians are killing their own to generate sympathy. They're bombing their hospitals, uh, things like this. And the Russians are desperately essentially trying to save lives. This is how it plays. And that's, um, and it's working. And before you ask yourself well, why it's working, just remember, you know, here with access to all information, what the attitude is to the elections and whether they were stolen and the pandemic, whether it's real or not. Mm -hmm. So it's not, propaganda can be extremely effective. And I'm uh, the only, so uh, to amplify here with why I think we're looking at a long-term thing and it's unlikely that he'd be deposed, who's gonna come after him? It's the same problem that these kind of regimes always face, which is everybody who may be contemplating, they need, popular support, which is not there, and they need uh, a path to what their future is going to look like, which you can predict in these regimes, whether you're going to be ending in a ditch because you lost or on the winning side. And uh, as Professor Roder said, they're all implicated in this. So I'm not holding out for a palace coup or an assassination attempt or anything like this or a popular revolt in Russia. We're in for the long haul. And as the economy collapses, that's going to be portrayed as we 
deliberately killing, waging war on Russian civilians. They're already calling it like this. Maybe let's also look at the Ukrainian um, side. There was a um, question from Martin Bunzel early in the um, conversation. Um, he asked about uh, this John Mersheimer argument about you know the West's responsibility essentially for the war. And then a follow-up question, maybe we can address that. Is Zelensky's recent conversion to pragmatic realism um, with respect to NATO, NATO application and the status of the Eastern provinces, something he, sh he should have come to years ago. So is there a sort of responsibility on the part of the Ukrainians for this situation um, with respect to this NATO membership? So I, I can just say something, I can speak a little bit to Ukrainian sentiment around mm -hmm. NATO membership. Um, the, the general feeling in Ukraine is that Ukraine has been fighting alone on a front line w against Russia, which has been waging a war on the EU and the US. And that nobody has been, and that's been happening since 2014 with the, uh, the, the support for these fringe uh, separatists in, in the Donbass region. And uh, you know, the idea is, look, you've, you've allowed us to be on your front line, <laughs> protecting you all from Russia. It's time for you to step in and help. And it makes sense that Zelensky would have supported that, um, that sentiment. That was, you know, the idea was, okay, this is, you know, let's, let's do this. Um, I think he's signaling in his switch. I think he's signaling uh, a pragmatism. I think he's signaling a willingness to sit down at the table if that, you know, if it's possible, I think he's, you know, and I and I am very happy to be corrected by some of the social scientists in the room, but I believe he's signaling even a willingness to consider appeasement as a strategy for um, allowing his country to survive and remain intact. Um, obviously, I don't see him going as far as stepping down and allowing a puppet person to sit, to replace him, but yeah, do, do others want to, to comment on this this shift on the part of Zelensky where he's now saying we would consider this? It looks like NATO is not going to help us anyway. Cool. I mean, th this is pure speculation, but I would imagine if Zelensky was willing to play the role, he's the ideal collaborationist in, in the minimal sense, in the sense that the president of Finland was the, the ideal um, uh, uh, collaborationist in reaching the agreement after World War II, um, which, which led to this Finlandization. Um, the, you know, I, my, my suspicion is that the reason the Russians are having these negotiations is that they are there waiting for the Ukrainians to come and say, we surrender. And that these really are not, except in a few technical details of, of evacuations and so forth, not intended to find a compromise solution. Um, and so if Zelensky is willing to play that role, and that's a very big if, um, uh, and it may take a lot more destruction be, uh, and death before he feels that he can sell that to his Ukrainian population, um, I don't see it happening any time in the, in the next few weeks, um, I, I just I'm, I apologize for being so gloomy, but I just foresee a, an incredible amount of suffering uh, on the part of the Ukrainian people um, in the next few weeks. Well, maybe let's get to a question that um, anticipates an even gloomier scenario, but that's perhaps on, on many people's minds from my colleague, uh, Pamela Radcliffe. She says, uh, a New York Times colonist tried to make the case for a direct US and European military intervention, which so far has been a very minority position. Is there any scenario for this that doesn't lead to a terrifying expansion into a world war? And I actually would like to add a question to that. So is there a possible scenario for, say, the use of a tactical nuclear weapon on the territory of Ukraine? And what would be the possible response to something like this? Branislav. Um, I do not see any prospect for direct military intervention, actually. 
people are calling for things like no-fly zones, but I don't think they understand what this actually would entail. Uh, it's um, you have to enforce a no-fly zone. You have to start shooting down at uh, Russians, uh, Russian planes. Of course, they will try to protect them, um, but their installations with which they will use to protect their planes are all in Russia or Belarus. So as they start shooting down our attempts to enforce the no-fly no zone, are we going to start shooting on things on Russian soil? And just think of how this is going to play domestically for Putin. This would be a propaganda gift for him as well. Um, there's a very serious likelihood that things might escalate. I do not think, however, that the nuclear threat is real. He has enough conventional weaponry of all sorts of nasty stuff that can cause tremendous destruction in Ukraine without escalating there. Uh, we always talk about he, you know, warned that Russia is a nuclear power, but NATO is a nuclear power as well. They do not forget that. So don't mistake. He's, I don't think he's mad or he's going to be pressing him and Shoigu. And, I mean, he needs two people at least to agree to press the red button there for it to work. Um, that this is something. It's a red herring. The, the, the Soviets before them rattled rockets periodically as well. So I think the reason we're not intervening is because we basically do not want to start a war with the Russians. And at this point, I, it may come to this if the civilian suffering really is enormous and there might be tremendous pressure in the West for intervention. There might be some sort of an attempt to do this, um, whether it's because, you know, we're going to fly um, our, you know, people with uh, Ukrainian uniforms like the Soviets did in Korea or shoot from, you know, dressed as Vietnamese as they did uh, in, in Vietnam against us. And then both sides pretend they don't see this. Uh, I don't know. But for now, the Ukrainians are fighting uh, alone. The best we can do is send them help um, aid but we cannot intervene directly at least that's what i think is going to happen i i was i was just going to add that you know putin when he went in on the day of the invasion compared this invasion to the iraq war right and he does this this is a rhetorical thing that he often will do he'll say well this is something you know i'm just i'm just playing by your rules america and i went back and reread he wrote this really weird manifesto that he posted to the kremlin website on um on july 12th of last year and I went back and reread that afterwards, and I'd forgotten that he'd actually um, compared anti-Russian sentiment in Ukraine to weapons of mass destruction. He uses this term in Russian. So he is, for him, the rhetoric of war can be, he plays fast and loose with this all the time. And it would be, it's very easy to spin anything into anti-Russian aggression. Um, and that's it may not work on uh, on the rest of the world, but it, it does seem to be working on his own his own citizens largely. OK, uh, Christina and Phil. I, ju I just want to I, I very much agree with my colleagues here. I just want to add um, that even um, after uh, the invasion of Crimea, when it seemed like Ukraine still had sovereignty over over the rest of the country, there were calls um, to send NATO or even Euro European troops into the country to protect against the potential invasion um, of Russia. And even then, um, leaders of both NATO and the European Union were extremely careful in their statements. And they were very clear that they, they saw that even a stationing of troops in Ukraine in times of peace um, would be extremely um, dangerous and uh, problematic with respect to the potential of a, of a, of a conflict with Russia. Phil. Um, the, on, the, on this nuclear issue, um, the administration, I, I think they've done an admirable, jo admirable job of drawing a line that the United States will not become directly involved in the in the combat, um, and they uh, most recently this issue of uh, you know wh whether we should uh, provide a no fly zone or send send the MIGs from Poland um, from an, uh, to an American base in Germany and then onto Ukraine, uh, and they've drawn uh, they've been very cautious about uh, doing anything that might be misconstrued by the Russians as direct American involvement. Already, you're seeing very intense public pressure uh, to, in fact, do things that might be construed by the Russian as direct American involvement. Um, and how long the administration can resist that if, in fact, it affects their poll standings 
I, I do not know. Uh, the real danger, however, it strikes me, is, is an accident. Uh, and since, since the Russians use their, their arms indiscriminately, if they were to somehow um, uh, launch uh, something intended to hit West, uh, Western Ukraine, but actually cross the Polish border, does this un, you know, lead to an unfolding of events? My bet is that as in previous crises with, between the, America and the Soviet Union, we will be very careful on both sides not to, uh, not to let this uh, escalate any further, that we, we're, as long as we're fixed on this danger, uh, we'll avoid the danger. And Russian nuclear strategy, the most recent version coming out in June of 2020, um, uh, underscores that they do not believe in first use of nuclear weapons uh, and that the, the only contingencies for which they might, uh, might imagine using these are cases where, the other, where the, their opponent initiates nuclear weapons or the existence of the Russian regime is, is, is it at threat then they might use the nuclear weapons. And all of that at the present time does not seem to be at risk in the current crisis. So I think uh, despite the, 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 the headlines, we may be relatively uh, safe at, at the present moment, as long as our, uh, governments on both sides are you know, focused on this issue. There's a um, comment from Sarab about the parallels to the situation in Syria, which um, is perhaps also important to acknowledge as a sort of template for this kind of warfare. Um, I actually had a question, and I'm afraid it's a rather defeatist question. Namely, if you think there is a sort of moment when it would be morally or politically justified to say that the Ukrainians should surrender, in order to avoid you know, more civilian casualties and perhaps organize a campaign of you know, civilian disobedience, non-cooperation, something like that. Branislav. Well, I think that's the wrong question to answer. This is not ours to decide. The Ukrainians will have to decide this. I right. think morally, we, are, we have to render them all assistance we can short of go going global war. Uh, and frankly, if there is a possibility that we will, NATO troops will confront Russians, I think the administrations here and in Europe have to start preparing their people for the possibility. Because the way this is going, uh, I don't think there will be peace while Putin is in power. And for the reasons I've outlined, I do not think that he'll be removed. So you're looking at a very long and bloody insurgency because I do not think the Ukrainians will surrender. Christina. I agree. What, what, is, what has been frustrating is to a certain extent the hypo hypocrisy of Western leaders um, throughout time where they have consistently encouraged Ukraine to look westwards and have officially at least um, kept on saying that Ukraine is a sovereign country and as a sovereign country can decide its own fate. But inofficially, it has been clear that um, leaders of the West have been extremely careful and have always seen Ukraine as a buffer country and have somewhat acknowledged Russia's claim um, of Ukraine being part of Russia and nothing else. And it was in part at least that encouragement that has led um, Ukrainian citizens and Ukrainian leaders to stand up to Russia um, over the last 10 years. And um, so, so I think some of that human suffering is a cause of, of, of these statements that haven't been very clear to the Ukrainian government in terms of what are the limits of Western support. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we have to close here. I would like to apologize to all the participants who posted questions uh, to which we could not get. Um, I would like to point you to this uh, next webinar um, on Monday at two, uh, 3, I think, which uh, addresses specifically also the Chinese role in this conflict. There were actually a couple of questions about this in the chat as well.
So again, um, thank you very much to all the participants for these really enlightening and uh, interesting comments and perspectives. Uh, I think the event did exactly what I hoped um, it would do. And thank you for the participants and uh, for asking your um, questions. Um, even though uh, we live in difficult times, I still hope you will have a nice afternoon and uh, an enjoyable um, weekend. So thank you very much and goodbye.